Hi, I see some of you joining us. We're gonna wait one more minute and then I'm gonna do a brief introduction. Oh, there's so many of you. All right, let's get started. So hi everybody, welcome to another installment of Project Heals Healing with Pride Week. I'm so excited to be here. I'm Em, I'm one of our board of director members. Um, and tonight's live is extra special, extra magical, and everything that I could have ever dreamed of. So please remember this live will be fundraising for our LGBTQ treatment equity program. And we are just so lucky because we have the most magnificent guests tonight. Um, so I'll introduce our guest and then they'll join us. So I am so excited to introduce Jeffrey Marsh. Couldn't say that to you all enough. Yes, the Jeffrey Marsh. Jeffrey is one of the world's foremost commentators on non-binary identity and activism in America with a message of positivity and inclusion and a deep knowledge of queer issues and history. Jeffrey has reported on LGBTQ topics for Time, Variety, Dutch National News, Channel RTL TV, Newsmax TV, and the BBC. Jeffrey was also a cultural consultant on non-binary identity for the Elizabeth Warren campaign, New York University, the office of Charlene McRae, New York City's first lady, GLAAD, MTV, Condonas, Them, and Teen Vogue. As an author, Jeffrey was the first prominent figure to use the, and abdicate for the use of they, them pronouns for trans and gender nonconforming people. Thank you very much. Jeffrey has also offered comment in the New York Times, BuzzFeed News, Reuters, Huffington Post, and Bustle, and has delivered keynote talks and participated on panels in, at university campuses worldwide, including NYU Florence, the University of Texas Arlington, and Penn State. Currently, Jeffrey is developing several TV shows centered around issues of LGBTQ identities and stories. And now I am super excited to welcome the Jeffrey Marsh. Hello. Hello. Oh, there I am. Welcome. Hi. Hello. You look so fabulous. I can't Thank right you. now. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. It's good to talk to you. I look fabulous. What about you? You look fabulous. What about you? I mean, I'm magical, but you taught me that. I mean, we can bask in each other's magic. How's that? I love it. Perfect. Well, thank you for being here for this week. Um, and so I'm going to start firing some questions at you and we'll see where this goes. How does that sound? Uh, of course. I might turn the Perfect. tables and ask you some things. Oh, please go right ahead. I could talk all night. Um, <laughs> do you remember the precise moment you decided to become the most radiant human being on the internet? Or was this a natural unfolding for you? Oh, uh, wow. It's really been since birth. I mean, we could go back before birth uh, for the radiance that is the universe that unfolds in each of us. But I don't know how spiritual you want to get this soon in a live. <laughs> as much as you would like. <laughs> <laughs> I am. You bring up a good point, actually. I mean, I love your question, of course, because who wouldn't want to answer such a question? But you bring up a good point that I'm a reflection. And the work that I try to do is reflect back, not just the beauty in not feeling confined to a gender box, but the beauty in not being confined to a person box. Yeah. Um, feeling like our spirit is part of the picture, feeling like our, um, gosh, when I say stuff is spiritual, I mean the things that we weren't taught, mostly mm -hmm. about ourselves. And sad to say, almost nobody is taught that they are perfect as they are, that they are beautiful, that they are a good, wonderful, hearted human being. So that's what I try to reflect to people. I love that so much. So I know that you share in your TED Talk that you're a Buddhist, I'm Quaker, and so I'm taught that the light of the universe is in each of us. And so when you talk, sometimes I just feel this deep spiritual connection to that idea that we are each perfectly imperfect, just 
in this moment for being. Yes, of course. And, you know, there's a great, great, great tradition of Buddhists and Quakers getting along yes. in America. And Quaker meeting, to me, has some very, very uh, nice parallels to what I studied at the Buddhist monastery. I know. Silence is actually very beautiful when you embrace yourself. Fine. I think most of us were taught to run from things like silence. Right? I know. Hopefully we can help people change that. <laughs> well, yeah, that's partly why I wanted to come and talk to you. Because I'm so glad. <laughs> when non-binary and trans folks reach out for help, they can be um, judged. You know, there's a yes. fear you have to do a lot of research to find somebody who's not going to be, what, grossed out by you? Yep. And to, to have to get help, first of all, <laughs> to admit that you have needs and you're a human being who has yep. needs. Like, that's the first hurdle. But the second hurdle is, like, is someone that I'm going to go to help for going to be transphobic, going to mm -hmm. be non-binary phobic? And then I have to deal with all that rigmarole in, in addition to being vulnerable and wanting help. It's, uh, we have extra steps that we have to go through and it's not fair, in my opinion. Agreed. It's not even yeah. close to being fair. Um, and I'm thinking, right, as you've, of course, had to go through all these extra steps in your life mm -hmm. to become you. And I'm wondering just how your career path came to be um, just in the place that it's in, you give us all so much love and energy every day on the internet. I try. <laughs> How, can I tell yeah. you a little story about it? Please. Okay. Um, when I, oh, I have it. Mm -hmm. I keep the book handy uh, for Same. product placement purposes. Same. <laughs> Yay. Um, we're nothing if not prepared, let me tell you. <laughs> so when I was, when I turned in my manuscript, I was the first non-binary author to work with what they call the big five publishers. So the mo you know, the most, the largest five in the US. And I was the first non-binary person, my publisher was Penguin, and the copy editor returned the manuscript to me and changed my pronouns in the manuscript from they to something they assumed <laughs> was my correct pronoun and said that they was not grammatically correct uh, and returned the manuscript to me. And so we had to have what we call in the business a teachable moment with them, uh, the folks, the copy editor and the copy, uh, copy editing department at Penguin about pronouns about why they're important about how to respect someone like me and and you know as much attention as I get there are still often those moments where I'm reminded that not everybody understands where we're coming from absolutely um it's almost like you tell someone you're non-binary for example and you're not human anymore Right? You're, you're a they, them, as if that's magically some kind of identity when really I'm just trying to teach you how I want you to speak to me so we can be human together. Well, I love that. I mean, it's, it's to me, oh, oh, I just love that you brought all that up because to me saying I'm non-binary is something I hope will spark a follow-up question. Yes. Not... And, and a lot of times it does, and I really love that. I really do, I don't consider, you know, I, I, I wanna be an open book and I wanna help people along. And I wanna, as you said so eloquently, teach people how to speak to me, but also make that human connection. Mm -hmm. And when we say I'm non-binary, I like to think of that as an invitation instead of a shutting down. Agreed, right? Isn't that the point of us? sharing our identity with the world and as you do so publicly is so that we can learn together, including those of us who identify the same and still don't, you know, none of us know all the things. That's right. That's right. And none of us, um, 
you know, I don't know if you were going to go here with your questions, but none of us have to. Yep. I, I spent a long time feeling, because I was the, the first in a couple of ways, feeling like I had to represent non-binary people. Mm -hmm. And there's just been so many of us throughout time in history that if someone thinks that all non-binary people are like me, they have they have more issues than I can help them with. Fair. <laughs> if you know what I mean. Like there's some the learning do. they need to do um, and it's not my responsibility, right? Agreed, right? We can't yeah. be responsible for everyone and everything. That's right. So, you know, this makes me think of what are you seeing in your work in terms of our cultural shift when it comes to gender? Well, I mean, that's a really broad question. I know. You know, you know what I love the most? Can I answer that? Please. One? That the pandemic gave people um, the context to come out as she they's and he they's. Yep. That this movement, which I think is directly related to <laughs> wearing sweatpants every day from the waist down, right? Yes, I, I agree. <laughs> And, you know, what I mean by that is having the chance to not have to perform and meet a standard with your gender and having the space to be introspective about who you are for you and not who you are for work, who you are for tradition, who you are for misogyny, who you are for whatever, right? For religious groups, right? As we were talking about before. But who am I for me? Mm -hmm. Who am I in my home <laughs> for months and months and months? And people took that as a great chance, as a launch pad to skyrocket into yes. adding they to their bio, right? Adding yep. they to their email signature. And to me, I, you know, the, the she days and he days that I talked to speak so eloquently about it being a an expansion of who they were which to me is the best story that you could tell i agree i have to say because i'm i don't know if i'll ever get the opportunity to say this yeah. to you watching a lot of your videos in the pandemic made it really easy for me to come out in the public spaces that i was still not out oh and i was able to become one of the people that did she they and now they them in a way that felt so comfortable and it really took being alone in this house with my partner and just me and being me all of the time and realizing I don't have to not be me all the time. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I don't have to not be me all the time. <laughs> wow. Like that's Wait a concept. A <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't have to be the me that everybody trained me into thinking me is. Yes. Right. And that is what people like us I don't want to speak for you. So you tell me if I'm wrong. But, you know, if it's not your experience, that is what people like you and I represent. Agreed. This, yes. And that's why it's so challenging for some mm -hmm. to see us and freeing for others to see us. Agreed. So much. I wish I could get every client that I work with on here. I've spent all week hearing about all of these stories about how a video that they watched or a parent watched of you changed mm -hmm. their relationship because parents now understand watching you, what they're doing to their children when they don't affirm their children, which is just such a, which is just such a gift to give people that opportunity to learn and be different and be better. Yeah. You, you mean because I talk about what a crummy childhood I have? Yes. You're very vulnerable and honest. Well, <laughs> upfront about it. And I, <laughs> yeah. I used to, you know, back in the days when I thought I have to represent non-binary people, mm -hmm. you know, I thought, well, there's this stereotype that LGBTQ people in general, but trans people, non-binary people are associated with childhood trauma. Yep. And people think that that's why we're trans, right? Of course. And I didn't want to, to uh, support that stereotype, right? I didn't want to give fuel to that. But then again, I realized, I mean... If people think that they have more problems than I can help them with. <laughs> and my childhood was what it was. And if I can alchemize, you know, if I could spin that into gold in a way that helps people 
today, I almost said young people, but not just, you know, helps LGBTQ people today, then I'm very happy, very happy about that. Oh, it's such a beautiful gift. When You're a beautiful you... gift. <laughs> oh, I'm gonna remember that forever. <laughs> when did you know that you were non-binary and that you were you? Or did you always know and it was more of a, you had to wait for your moment? It's so interesting because almost every, not to call anybody out, almost every cis het interviewer asks me, when did you know you were different? That exact phrase. And I started noticing that this was getting repetitive, but I also started noticing that it was kind of othering. Yes. And so I always answer that question with, I'm not different. No. I want the same things. I always wanted the same things. And I always felt mm -hmm. uh, like a full human being. And to be specific about your question, I would steal, <laughs> I would steal all the princess dresses in kindergarten and I got in trouble for it. And I remember my teacher in kindergarten had felt characters. So my teacher cut out felt a felt boy and a felt girl. Um, and we had to dress them for the day with felt clothing. And it was, you were supposed to learn about weather or something, how to, you know, dress for what it, what it, what's going on outside or something. And I would get in trouble for putting the, you know, quote unquote, wrong clothing with the wrong kid and stuff like that. <laughs> I was really gender enthusiastic and gender effusive, even, even way back in kindergarten. Which is so interesting. So I get asked this question now all the time. Every single person in my life I've ever come out to, except for my parents. My parents have not asked, when did you know? They just accept and move on, which is really beautiful, right? And they're older and it's great, but everyone wants to know. And I always feel mm -hmm. the same way, which is, I mean, I've always been like this. Just one day there was a name for it. So cool. Like, <laughs> like I don't know how to answer that question eloquently, except to kind of like you think of these beautiful childhood moments where um, I have a younger brother and you know he played basketball so I wanted to play basketball and I was the only girl on the basketball team and then we wanted to do art so we did it together we did everything together and so I had this gender neutral childhood I didn't know things were gendered for mm. such a long time in my life which is such a privilege and I realize that now as an adult what a privilege getting that opportunity was but how, yeah. how do you tell someone when you figured out you were you? I just, I don't know. I got born. My mom gave me a name. She hoped it was good enough and we called it a day. <laughs> yeah. And again, you come back to that idea that it's otherizing yeah. and even pathologizing. Yes. It's like, when did you, when did you have a realization that you're a weirdo? <laughs> it's like, uh, thanks. Um, yeah. Not that that's suggestive or anything. Of course. Yeah. It was just kind of always me. And it sounds like you were always you. Yeah. And that's not to also, I feel like now's the time in the conversation to insert the idea that if someone feels like, you know, they they went through the steps like you did, where they, they like, oh, I could be a he, they, huh, yeah, yeah. You know, and it doesn't seem like I was born this way, right? That That is particularly valid too. We don't have one narrative of what it's like to be us. And that to me is part of the beauty of being us. Agreed, so much. Um, so for everyone watching and hearing your story and who've watched you probably for a very long time, um, what advice would you give to people that feel like there's something blocking their way? Step over it? <laughs> what do you mean something's blocking their way? What do you mean? Um, Are we talking about you? No, oh. I, I'm actually, <laughs> funnily enough, you specific. know, I've watched quite a few of your videos after joining this board and I blew up every barrier in my way and said that wasn't the life I wanted to live anymore. Kaboom, kaboom. kaboom. Um, and, so I can, and so I can tell people how I do that, right? Yeah. But I'm wondering how you have done that in your life as well. Well, I studied at a monastery <sighs> and you know, I studied Zen for 20 years, that helped. And um, 
I think of the Zen principle of a gateless gate. Meaning you think there's a gate there, but, and you're trying to open the gate and you think your purpose in life is to, to try to open the gate. But one day you realize that the gate was never there. It's sort of that for me, when I encounter something that's an obstacle and not, mm, I should be very specific, not that there aren't systemic forces against people like us. Yes, there are. But sometimes I am pushing hard to open a gate that I built. That's such a good point to bring up to people, right? Often we think the gate, the barrier, whatever our word is, is this thing that others put there and often we realize that we put it there for ourselves for many reasons, both good and bad, but that is kind of the reality, right? Sure. So, I mean, what are your thoughts as someone who's, you know, a social media influencer on a kind of how social media plays a role for everybody in self in image, self concept, and also how barriers kind of have gotten broken through this process? Well, yeah, like anything, social media is a double edged sword, right? It is so heartbreaking to me that when LGBTQ kids are at their most vulnerable, like, I mean, in a lifetime. So when you're 12, 13, and I'm not, if you're 12 and watching this, I'm not saying you're different. I'm not saying you're necessarily vulnerable, but I'm just saying in general, um, when I was 12 and 13, I was really, really vulnerable. And gosh, if you're on the internet, you're going to see the most horrible things. You're going to look through my comments and see the most horrible things. So it breaks my heart that young LGBTQ people would come to me to watch videos that finally affirm who they are. And underneath is a bunch of hate. So where they are to be loved the most is also the most hate. That's heartbreaking to me. But I've decided and decided a long time ago that I have to continue doing my mission in this very imperfect way. Uh, you know, this very imperfect forum, this imperfect app, this imperfect internet. I got to keep going because if I can reach just one person, I'm very, very glad that that happened. Well, you definitely have. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it was you. <laughs> I was definitely one of those people. Um, so, you know, one of the reasons why we asked you here, you know, Project Heal, trying to help people get the help that they need. Um, Indeed. Over 38% of our applicants happen to be LGBTQ, many of whom are over 24. Therefore, the non-standard, whatever that means, version of someone with an eating disorder. Yep. And, you know, we have to have a treatment equity program because queer people finding treatment that is affirming, Right where staff can model for them by being, right? A lot of that doesn't exist without money. And we're just wondering if you had any words of wisdom or encouragement for people right now that are struggling with their identity, with their body image, with food, what would you want them to know? I would first, you know, if we were one-on-one -on -one having a cup of tea with anybody, um, I would want to get to the bottom of what it means. I would want to get really clear about where the struggle is coming from. Because we tend to, we've all said, you know, I struggle with my identity. And whenever I hear phrases like that, I think, what percentage was yours? Mm -hmm. I realized at a certain point, the thing I struggle with most is society's perception of my identity. And it's really, there is, I don't have to tell you twice, right? People are trained and encouraged and told lots of horrendous, horrible things about food and what it means and about body image and what it means. and there to blame yourself seems like a huge, horrible, awful, unfair 
deeply, deeply, deeply sad um, first step that we all seem to go through. <laughs> so I guess that was a really long-winded way of saying I would hope to convince anybody on earth there's nothing wrong with you. Agreed. That's, that is the place to start a journey of, of support and talking to people and finding out what's available and all that good stuff. Absolutely. Oh, I think sometimes, and I know you know this as well, um, you know, there's a part in your book where you talk about that perfect idea of prom which mm. s sat with me so much um, because I do sing that song from the bangles in the shower myself mm -hmm. to this day. Um, reading it and remembering those moments in my life of feeling like I'm an other, there is something wrong with me, there is no help for me, when in reality, there was nothing wrong with me, there was hope. And Look at, look at not just us talking now, everyone at Project Heal, all these people who've logged in to hear us talk, right? There are people, which is kind of amazing and magical that there are people in the world that actually care. Oh, goodness, yes. And what passes for socialization of children and young folks is usually convincing them through every single method you can think of not to care. And that's a huge, huge mistake, in my opinion. No, I agree. Right? Nothing like teaching a kid not to have feelings, to make well-rounded adults. Sure. <laughs> yeah. And not to care about themselves and not to care about others and not to care about the earth and, you know, not to care about other creatures. And yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, before our time is up, do you have any other words of wisdom for us? <laughs> I mean, probably. <laughs> I'll tell you something. I'll tell you something um, that just dropped in for 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 our discussion. That might be that might be pertinent. You know, it goes beyond. There is nothing wrong with you. I think being a, you know an influencer and being having been on TV. <laughs> and having a successful book and all of that sort of stuff. I try to talk as much as I can about the times when it was just me and the mission. What I mean by that is, you know, I always felt this impulse to try to help other people feel like there's nothing wrong with them. And I felt like that from a very, very young age. And there were times when basically everybody else was telling me, don't do that, right? And I would hope anybody watching right now feels, senses, however faint it is, knows that kernel of truth that there is nothing wrong with you and that the path you're on can absolutely include help connection, people to talk to, support, and that doesn't make you wrong or bad, that doesn't make you weak, it doesn't make you, mm, it, it makes you perfect and wonderful, because it's something very human that we all need. Oh, I love that. Humanity and being human as that perfection that isn't perfection, right? It's both at the same time, right? We are yes. perfect as is, and we don't have to meet some sort of like weird ideal of what it means to be perfect. Yes, it's all true. I mean, I just can't thank you enough for being here. You know, we, we took a chance at messaging you, fingers crossed. You slid crossed. into the DMs. I did, I've, I've never done that before. It was so exciting. <laughs> um, I just can't thank you enough for being here, not just to talk to me, but for Project Heal, for all the people that were helped by our donations tonight. Um, of hopefully course. we can all keep reminding you that you're magical as well. You're an angel and thank you for holding space for all of us. I try my best. This was a lovely space because of you. So thank you thank for your you. kindness. Of course.
Um, for those of you that are watching, don't forget, this will be saved. You can see the whole thing and watch it a million times. If you didn't donate tonight and you ever have the extra pennies, just visit our website, theprojectheal.org, and we will happily accept your money so all of these people can get better. Exactly. Anytime. Any hour of it. the day or night. <laughs> you can bring it to my house. I'll drop it off at headquarters. <laughs> Thank you again, Jeffrey. Thank you. Bye for now. Bye. <laughs>